We all carry a backpack. This backpack has things in it that will shape who we are, whether they're experiences, items, or ideals. In my backpack, you will find a picture of me and my mother, and me in a Pokemon shirt. I love that shirt. Um, so this is to signify the roots that I have in being an immigrant. I moved here at the age of four from Puerto Rico, and in the time between May and September, I had to learn English to actually keep up with school. In my backpack, you will find a necklace with the Puerto Rican flag. This is to signify my Latino culture and heritage. It's something that has shaped me into the person I am now and has also been a big way of how I traverse and navigate this world. In my backpack, you will find a pin that I'm currently wearing. Um, and this pin uh, is representative of the Rutgers University crest. This was given to me by one of my mentees, and it's something that I very much cherish. I'm the first person in my family to be able to go to university, and this pin is something that reminds me of how passionate I want to be about fighting for education and access for all. <laughs> in my backpack, you will find a lucky duck hat, and this is something that I get made fun of a lot. Um, this hat is probably one of my most prized possessions. On the top picture, that was the first time I ever became a mentor to a group of students. And the bottom picture is when I, was be, when I became an RA. But that hat represented how I learned how empathy is such a powerful way of how when we put ourselves in another person's shoes, that is a form of leadership. And lastly, in my backpack, you will find a birthday letter. This birthday letter was also given to me by one of my mentees. During my fourth year of school, because I'm a non-traditional student, I was diagnosed with a disability. It was a form of panic disorder, and it almost cost me my shot at actually finishing school. It was very difficult to understand and navigate what this meant for me, what this meant for my professional, my personal, my academic life, but it was in finding these resources and also the support that I had around me that this letter signifies the love that they gave me. But hello, everyone. My name is Luis Fernandez, and I'm a student here at Rutgers University. I'm studying information technology and informatics, and my passion lies at the intersection of human rights and technology. It's a lot of the work that I was able to do with Google, and our work looked at bridging the digital divide that existed within our communities. But one of the things that I've learned throughout my time at Rutgers, and I've had the opportunity to be an RA, I've had the opportunity to hold five national fellowships, I've had the opportunity to attend hearings in the White House and also the UN, and I'm also very passionate about making sure that there's always access and opportunities for those who either look like me or have the same background as me. But what I took away from all those experiences was that empathy was one of the most profound ways that we can make an impact in this world. So what I did in my first activity was to unpack what empathy meant. I showed you what my metaphorical backpack had and being vulnerable. And being vulnerable is part of what empathy means. And I think this is something that sometimes we're afraid to do. It's scary, and trust me, I know, because I used to not be really good with expressing my feelings. But I also learned that change can happen on a, on a personal scale as well. With that being said, today's talk, I want to talk about how empathy can be a blueprint for changing the world. We all want to change the world, but change also starts on a personal level. It's by understanding how we can become the best versions of ourselves that can lead to how we can make macro level change. And as for the theme of this conference, I wanted to really narrow in on what you can all get out of this experience and how empathy can be a way and a skill and a strategy of how you can change the world. First, though, I want to talk about these two terms that I feel like are used interchangeably. The first is sympathy, and the second is empathy. So sympathy is an acknowledgment of someone's feelings. It's not necessarily deep. You can see that someone's sad. You can acknowledge that someone is sad. But empathy, that's where the work comes in. That's a lot deeper. That's something that you have to be able to dig deep within yourself, and it's a shared experience. The reason I shared my backpack was because I want you to understand what experiences have shaped my life and to empathize being a two-way street. That is why I believe that sympathy is expressed. It's something that you give to someone, but empathy is shared. And also realizing that empathy, to go deeper, you have to be critical. You have to use analysis. Because to change the world, right, it's not easy. But I do believe that empathy, again, is that blueprint for that. But there are two factors that I want you to keep in mind as you navigate this. One is someone's identity. 
Our identity is very important. These identities can be, uh, can be factors such as our race, our gender, our class, our ability. And also Kimberly Crenshaw, who's a famous black feminist who's paved the way for a lot of social justice movements, talked about this idea of, of intersectionality, that your identities are compounded, right? You're not just, so in this example, I'm not just Luis, an immigrant, right? I'm not just Luis, a student. I am a first generation student. I'm also a person who identifies with having a disability. These things are all compounded and my identity will, uh, will be very different than those of others. But there's also power in your story and your narrative. The second is context and history. Understanding where someone lives, their background, how they were raised, their circumstances, whole myriad of other factors can be very important in understanding how you empathize. When we approach a lot of our work within the CLP, we had to understand how is it that people were using technology or not using technology. But we also, but we also had to understand what was, the, what was the demographic of New Brunswick? What were people using? What were they not using? What was their income level, right? It was important to understand how these contextual factors really were part of how we empathize with those who we were trying to best serve. But I wanna take a step back and think of how empathy is a strategy. Using this as a lens to change the world. And if you think about it, empathy is something that we use every single day, though we sometimes don't talk about it. So empathy can be used as a way of how are we making sure that people who are being affected by decisions are in that space. So if there's an issue about women's rights, are women in that space? If there are, <laughs> I've been to a lot of spaces where we're talking about disability rights, but there are people who were able-bodied and they weren't having any representation or just input from those who were, um, who were disabled. So it's interesting to realize how empathy is not always necessarily a negative thing, but it's understanding how you can better design, how you can build representation and visibility. And I think this is important to see how empathy is a strategy in the way that we design spaces or even programs or even help someone be their authentic self in what they do. One of the stories that I have is when I was diagnosed with my disability, I almost failed out of school. It was a very hard time. And I took time off and I was trying to learn how to navigate what it meant to have this, this panic disorder. So I came across this organization called Lyme. Lyme works to help students uh, who identify with having a disability have access to corporate opportunities such as Google, Facebook, Bloomberg, whole myriad of companies. But what I love about Lyme is that they helped me understand that my disability was not a form of inability. My disability became another form of ability in the way that I really traversed and navigated the world. It taught me that every day I have to make decisions, right? And that's something that is strategy. I have to understand how to pick apart things and know exactly how to analyze. But what I've realized is that by one, having a shared experience of how people know that my identity is part of who I am and also how I navigate the world, that makes my experiences, my insights, and my identities valued in any space that I go. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was the statistic of one in four and one in 19. So this week, we had Joe Biden, the former vice president, come to Rutgers. And, <laughs> and, and one of the campaigns that was currently happening this week was the Turn the Campus Purple campaign, which is looking at how all of us at Rutgers can help combat the issue of sexual violence and sexual assault. Last year, when I did my fellowship with Breakthrough, one of the issues that I was looking at is how, how is it that we can use empathy as a way to disrupt and dismantle these violent structures. So the reason why this number is important is because one in four women will experience some form of sexual violence before the time that they graduate, and one in 19 men will. And what I've realized is that by using empathy, and I don't mean condoning, I'm talking about putting yourself in the ways of how you can understand how these systems of violence work, because if you can understand how a system works, you can dismantle it. So that led me to start a masculinity workshop within the Greek life to actually talk about how are these norms, these ideas, these behaviors, really inflicting violence within our community and how is it that we can pick apart that? So we talked about masculinity and all these things. So I want you to think of how is it that you can put yourself in the shoes of those, whether it's a positive or negative thing, and learn how to pick apart these violent structures or even how we may selves be, may be complicit within that as well. One of the things that I've learned is that contrary to what you may believe, truth is not objective, it is subjective. Our experiences, will shape our realities, and our realities will shape our truth. Everyone here has their own individual truth. These can be framed by the way that our politics inform our lives, our ideals, or even our purpose. 
but it's important to realize that everyone's truth is valid. And what I see is that there's a lot of dismissiveness, especially when we live in a very hyperpartisan age. But I want you to remember that everyone's truth is crafted by what they have felt and what they have experienced. And to understand how you can connect your truth to theirs, and how is it that you can understand how that has shaped their life. What I've learned is that there are two barriers that I've seen usually that come in the way of empathy. These are the two Ps. The first P is privilege, and the second P is perspective. Everyone in this room was brought up differently. We have different ways of how we navigate the world or how we view the world. But what I've realized is that our perspective may sometimes be a barrier in the way that we really navigate this work. So I'll go back to the example of a lot of our work within New Brunswick to bridge the, the digital divide. We have access to technology every day. So even though we were trying to do well in, in actually bridging that divide, our perspective came from being able to know how this works. So we had to step back and say, we need to make sure that we have representation, that we center those who we're trying to serve, and make sure that their voices are heard, and that they're part of this process. Because our perspective may have blinded us without us even realizing. And then the second was privilege. Understanding how privileges are relative to each other, and understand how we may sometimes be complicit in a lot of these structures, or even understand how we can use our privilege to leverage um, work and within even movements or even just in everyday life, how is it that we can achieve liberation for all? This is something that I keep in mind every single day, and it's something that, again, it takes a lot of critical analysis, not just on other people, but within yourself. We had this idea of the other, right? That this person is ascribing to this narrative, right? We have biases and stereotypes that are reinforced every single day by either people that we're surrounded with or even media. But it's important to make sure that, which is something that leads us to my next slide, that we learn, unlearn, and relearn. Learning, we learn every single day. But what I actually found myself doing more than ever is unlearning. How is it that the ways that we were taught, how the world works, how we have stereotypes on you know, certain people, how is it that those things can be violent and detrimental to mental health and even a myriad of other issues. But what I've learned is that Learning is the easy part. Unlearning is understanding how you can be critical of how you've learned and unlearn those hateful things. And empathy is a great way of doing that. Me being an immigrant, there's always this rhetoric of there's this bad immigrant who always wants to take up X, Y, Z. But I wonder how many of those people actually talk with immigrants. How many of it, or how many people have just heard these stories and will, and will just continue to have those stereotypes? And again, we talk about social change on this macro, worldwide level, but that all starts with us as well. And then the last is relearn. So you're all at TED today. You've all probably learned a lot. I want you to think of how you can apply these three things, what you've learned, what you're unlearning, and what you're going to relearn to help you in achieving this world change. And as I said, I want you all to think of what you've learned in this space. How is it that you can take what you've learned here and apply it to the small interactions that can lead on a macro level? Because the hope is that we are not the generation of tomorrow. We are the generation of the present. We're building principled leaders that will one day make an impact in the lives of others, whether it's in a small community level or on a world level. But I want to thank you all for taking time to listen to my talk, and I hope that you can continue to unpack what empathy means and make that a shared process with those around you. Thank you. Thank you.